Let me begin by saying that I uh, was an enthusiastic supporter of this application for the grant that came through, and I'm extremely grateful that these series, uh, this series is beginning and that we have the opportunity for these kinds of conversations. Secondly, I want to say that I'm really glad that the very first of these is planted uh, right in the middle of Holy Week. I, I can't think of a better uh, place that a conversation like this should be located than in that kind of a liturgical moment, partly because it catches us up in a much bigger story and a much greater narrative than simply the question of theological education, evangelical or not, white or not. It catches us into the uh, bigger narrative of the story of what God is about in the world. And uh, and whatever hope there is in this conversation only lies there. So we have to work it out in the most uh, pragmatic and practical and realistic grounded terms of ordinary, embedded, embodied life. But uh, the cast of hope that the that the gospel itself creates for us is the only thing that, at, at, at least for me, motivates a sustained conversation and a a sustained set of decisions about how it is that we go forward in, in changing institutions, subverting, uh, and or navigating, or both. So I'm very grateful uh, for the planners of this and for the work that's been done to get us ready for this conversation. I want to just um, <clears throat> share a couple of things. Today at lunch, I had, a, as I do each month, a conversation with, it, with faculty, and one of the things that we talked about uh, today was the meaning of what it is to live in Holy Saturday and how much a conversation like this today is really a conversation between somehow the cross and the resurrection, an unfinished and and silent period in which it can easily appear as though there, there's almost nothing really happening. Um, and yet there is a sense that there is something uh, perhaps by the work of the Spirit that is unfolding. And it was interesting as we were having this conversation and as uh, Oscar Garcia Johnson and I were interacting in particular within that conversation, he had talked about that, particularly from uh, a, a, the point of view of a Latino and a person who was trying to understand how to think about many geopolitical uh, realities and what it was like for him to use the reference to Holy Saturday as a place that gives him clarity and understanding refugees, immigration, uh, social and political transition. But I found that when I started speaking uh, about Holy Saturday in the conversation, it immediately, in my ears, let alone in anyone else's ears, in my ears, it begins to play in a very different way. In his vocabulary, I would say it played as a, as a place of rich meaning, a kind of holding tank in which uh, a time between times is rich with its fermentation and possibilities. When I began to talk about it, it easily begin to sound like a place of deflected responsibility and of, of kicking a can down the road and of turning away from engagement. An excuse to maintain, in other words, potentially white privilege as opposed to actually either navigating uh, disruption or um, subverting it. So in the spirit of a richer Holy Saturday, let me uh, give you some of uh, my reflections, brief as they will be. I think the first thing is that to state some some fairly obvious things, but I think are important simply to name. Uh, one of those is that, of course, we are stuck in educational terms. We are stuck in a very deep cultural narrative. And the narrative, uh, before it ever becomes specifically informed by anything theological or uh, evangelical, it is simply shaped by the forces of culture, in, in particular the Western European um, university system in particular. So as a person who had the opportunity to go to Cambridge University, who was a student at Jesus College, uh, where yes, people you know yell "Go Jesus" uh, in the middle of athletic events. Um, you also have um, a, a college whose foundations uh, go back to the 11th and 12th centuries. So for at least that period of time, um, the university system that we are now an expression of is caught up in an embodied form that that took the the shape that it did in the force of European education. It's interesting to me that as a student there, one of the markers was that there were no markers. So you either knew where you were to go or you shouldn't be there. That was sort of the assumption. It thrived on the absence of signage. The assumption was if you're inside, you'll know where to go. If you don't know where to go, you shouldn't be here. So a sign isn't necessary. 
If that's not a closed example of a closed society, a cloistered reality, a social bond that that excludes and includes, um, I could. Uh, it, it, no more needs to be said. The very first day I first lived in England, I said hi to an English person. He said, "No, we don't say hi here. We say hello." And so uh, it began. All an expression of a kind of, for me even uh, as a highly oppor- uh, opportunity oriented person. Uh, I was clearly set in my place in a context which was, uh, in that case, not driven by racial reality, but certainly by a kind of cultural supremacy that said, we hold the terms, we set the stage, we know the vocabulary, we know the places, we know the issues, we know the people, we know the concerns. We are clearly the holders of the keys. And if you're here, you're here as a temporary and rather awkward guest who fortunately pays tuition. And we will eventually, if you succeed, allow you to go on your way with a degree. Uh, but we're not going to yield a lot more than that. That The subtlety and profundity of the way that seeps out in every possible corpuscle of, of society and culture uh, holds the educational enterprise. And in a culture like an English culture in particular, I would say a European culture, a French culture, certainly a German culture, all language-dominated cultures where the people who control language are the people that control the culture. In that kind of a context, you end up having then educational systems that say that the people who control the language get to hand the language to the others, and they will do with it probably a poor job of what we alone could really do with it. But you will, again, be allowed in the system insofar as you participate in that kind of a way. Now, that system, of course, then literally exported means that some of the first institutions of higher education in the United States are the the literal uh, bearers of the same names, the same history, the same tradition, the same cultural shape, the same presumption that was part of, uh, of, in many cases, the same kind of educational and cultural hierarchy. It also, of course, was formed by the time it came to our uh, our shores, um, that is the United States shores, it became a, a, a form also of often theological education. And that theological education, which was at the background of the institutions uh, like Harvard and others, Princeton, were institutions that bore a certain and now additional layer. In addition to culture, it was also this burden of a theological tradition, which was a theological tradition that at the very least had complicity in all kinds of compromises and abuses of power, which had been a significant part of the history of the church in in Europe. Um, And it also carried protests against that power. So you had other institutions that were formed as people who came to these shores in reaction uh, to that background. And I think that circumstance of the layering of the broad culture, the layering of educational culture, the layering of theological culture, all starts creating really the the formation of the things that ultimately decades uh, later become something like Fuller Seminary, but over the course of that time, end up creating all kinds of institutions that are the embodiment of educational hierarchies that are embedded in language systems, that are embedded in cultural systems, that are embedded in theological systems, all of which uh, gives keys to some and deprives keys to others. And in the Protestant Reformation, a moment that could have been a moment of, of actually giving truly the the book of the people to the people, instead gets deferred uh, to really the book that is now given almost in a parallel way to the sacraments that were given to priests. The Bible was in the end given to scholarly pastor theologians. So Calvin defends the legitimacy of an ordinary reading of the Bible, but then writes 20,000 pages of commentary in order to help the ordinary reader. That tension is a further demonstration of this sense that there's both release and freedom and also deprivation that is going on back and forth. And that struggle um, is a a representation of education, an education that's grounded in a theological tradition, that's worried about truth and control and power and authority, all of which has to be sorted out in, in varying ways, but which, again, is managed under the hands of people who happen to live in the dominant culture, in the dominant form of the culture, which is often the most educated and literate forms of the culture, which then includes and excludes uh, at will and through systems that become so embedded in the way the culture operates that we just take it for granted that this is how human life is ordered. Clearly, uh, that is subverted by a still deeper theological narrative than the ones that we've been talking about. So if in this week of Holy Saturday, we think about both the giving of 
of um, the authority that is uh, given to the church to carry out the life and ministry of Jesus in the world, we also acknowledge that there's this uh, theological narrative that leads on the one hand to something as dramatic as Ephesians 2, a sense that God is creating a new humanity that is uh, that is not a humanity that simply is a mirror of our own sociology, but a new sociology that's written uh, out of the life and blood and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And yet on this side of the practice of that great news, which we celebrate on Easter, is a church that has actually practiced not living that into that new humanity, but sort of duplicating the humanity that we had before and simply baptizing it in Jesus's name with many of the same sociological, political, social, racial, gender structures that were in place before that uh, good news was preached or uh, enacted and made possible. So I think that story intersects with American history in one of the most poignant and pervasive ways in this conversation, of course, through the African slave trade. And it's in that vortex, beginning, uh, as it could be argued, in the 14th century with the doctrine of discovery and the way that that got used across the so-called colonial world, which ultimately takes its own particular form here and begins to be both implicitly and complicitly drawn into an American church narrative in which the validation of the legitimacy of owning other people for other people's ends becomes a defensible Christian position. That reality, while uh, it would seem to most of us today uh, would be perverse and scandalous, of course exists in vivid, ongoing, daily ways. Now, culturally morphed over the 400 years into looking like something quite different than that form of slavery, but which nevertheless is a form of extraordinary theological and now theological, economic, and social uh, oppression, which is the reason in part that we're having this conversation, because all of that is to say, however that narrative plays, it's then never going to be wedded to the upward achieving high dominant culture narrative of how typically white educational, linguistically powerful people can actually determine the story of a nation. And that, in the life of the church, is the cancer that is at the core of the American evangelical church. Because probably as much as any other single voices that are indicting to us today about the problem that we're concerning concerned with is written in relationship in part to African-American slaves. African slaves, before that, of course, there is also the, the issue of Native Americans. And after that, and roughly coterminous a little bit later on, will be the Latino population. And still later after that, will be the Asian population as it comes into North America. All of which, and each in its own way, gets overwritten by a white narrative of power and authority that I think is offered with all kinds of motives, some of which are are sacred and holy, and many of which are intertwined with uh, attitudes of culture and presumption of stuckness that leave us in the circumstance that we're in today, where statistics like the ones uh, that that Amos mentioned a moment ago become so uh, vivid to us because it's so clear that the system is stacked to to produce the result that it has achieved. That is the tragedy. That's what has to be certainly subverted, certainly navigated, certainly undone. But again, bringing us back to Holy Saturday, I have to say it is extremely sobering to try to think through, even in the greatest, most passionate will for that to be achieved, there are so many ways that that is made more difficult and more problematic than any system change would suggest or than any uh, particular uh, decision might might lead to. It is a subtle cancerous growth that can that still that holds us in its grip and it subverts the power and glory of the gospel and leads us into a context where the story of the church has to continue to be the story of, of a confession and participation in oppression and injustice in ways that are not something outside the faith, but actually inside the practices of the, of the church. It was not long ago I was speaking at a place where I was told on my way to this place where I was speaking uh, about the, the way that this particular uh, conference center had engaged in the most radical acts of social and racial reformation in order to be able to make this conference center open to people of all colors. Now, 
as I was hearing about this, I thought, well, this doesn't really fit the narrative of what I think I'm going to see. And, and as I got to the place where I was speaking, um, here were thousands of people who I had just been told could become populated by the variety of, of races that God might uh, have created and, and made it possible for them to be present. And there was one person of color and there was one person of color because he was my friend who had come from a completely different state in order to be present in that event. On the one hand, there was this amazing declaration of we have fought the good fight, we have made the door open, we flung it wide, and there was one person of color. It was, um, it was hard actually to go on and speak after having heard the language narrative, which was so subverted by the actual facts on the ground, which told such a radically different story. So let me conclude. As a person who is myself, as a tall, white, educated male, who's been given every opportunity of dominant culture, my first calling has to be to listen both first to God and simultaneously to my neighbor, all of my neighbors, the complex, diverse neighbors that tell me a story that is not my story that is not my life, it's not my experience, it's not my sociology, it's not the place that I live. I want and need to hear that. I, I continue daily to realize how much more educated I need to become in the stories of people who are not my particular background and opportunity. I also need to lay down as much as I possibly can my own power in that process, both as I'm listening and as I'm at least trying to respond. And that leads me to then say, there's, there's a combination of tensions that I think I try to hold on to. I want every day to carry these two things simultaneously. The first is I wanna carry a very passionate urgency about how important this issue is. I can't think of anything more urgent in the life of the church, not least the American church and higher education than this issue. And secondly, to realize this is gonna be a longer, harder work than I even can imagine. And I never want the, that to be a cause for losing the urgency. So it is always a both end thing. It has to always be both particular on the ground in real specific terms, localized terms, specific institutional terms, individual decision terms, and systemic terms, longer term systemic terms. It has to be always both. It's not just systemic, it's not just particular. It's gotta always be both and, and eat, either could intimidate and threaten the other. Thirdly, I hope it leads me and the institution, this institution and other institutions, churches and contexts, higher education contexts, to be both repentant in the sense of taking true responsibility and turning from those places and seriously engaged in reordering together in a way that is not hierarchically uh, determined, but includes uh, all the voices that need to be considered in the context of that and structures that give authority and power to a multiple set of voices. And finally, um, to a combination on the one hand of humility before the very task and the urgency of it and the, the, um, the inadequacy that I feel and I know others probably feel in that. And at the same time, the confidence, the, the confident insistence that it must be the case that we go down a road uh, toward the dismantling, the decentering, the uh, subverting, and the navigating of white uh, evangelical higher education. Mm -hmm.